Before I get into my, my formal presentation, uh, let me take a few minutes to, to give you sort of a thumbnail. First of all, this year is the 75th anniversary of the founding of the Mont Pelerin Society. It was brought together, uh, a group of about, I guess it must have been about 45, 50 people, if I remember correctly, brought together by the famous Austrian economist Friedrich Hayek uh, to uh, a mountain called Mont Pelerin in Switzerland in April of 1947. The context of this was, is that this was shortly after the Second World War. And for the prior 25 years, the world had been moving in a sharply anti-liberal direction. The, the world before the First World War, before 1914, while certainly not perfect or an ideal world, basically not only practice, preached, but practiced many of the institutions of the, the liberal ideal. There was relatively free trade in the world. There was relatively free movement of people. Before 1914, there were no passports or visas. You were a free person. You moved, you lived, you worked where you wanted to. to uh, if I can say, my grandparents, both on my mother's and my father's side, came as small children to America from Europe in the years before the First World War. And there were no restrictions. You didn't, there were no, there were no entry quotas. There, there was no background security checks. There was no masks. I mean, my gosh, you, 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 you saved up enough money to buy a ticket on a, on, a, on a ship across the Atlantic Ocean, and it might have been a very modest and low-level cabin or space on the ship, but you bought your ticket, you arrived, if I can say it, in New York City, in Harbor of New York. You would land on a place called Ellis Island, a little island just south of Manhattan in New York City. And uh, were there immigration authorities? Yes. But they would be concerned only with the following. Do you have a communicable disease, something that you could pass on to someone else? If, if you had, they would hold you in quarantine until that period ended. Uh, they would ask another question. Uh, they would ask you a word that in English is now considered inappropriate. Are you an imbecile? That's just meaning do you have mental defect. A concern with could you support yourself in America. But the concern was not that you were going to become someone dependent on the government's welfare system. There was no welfare state. They were concerned that you would become a burden on private charity. Not the government, but the generosity of private charity. But if you did not have any mental limit, and if you did not have a communicable disease, you boarded a small ship. It took you from Ellis Island to the southern tip of Manhattan Island. You disembarked, and guess what? Welcome to America. You're a free person. That's it. You could live there and work. You could become a citizen or not, as you wanted. But it didn't matter. It did not matter. That's what it was. That world also was one of free capital movement. Investment crisscrossed the, the world. We talk today often of globalization. But the fact was, to a great extent, before the First World War, the world had become a very integrated global economy. But that world, however imperfect from that liberal ideal, how imperfect that world might have been, it was a liberal world. And following World War I, it was shattered. Government controls in wartime. All the major countries are in a war. No free immigration, trade barriers, rising taxes, wage and price controls. Government either control or even nationalization of industry for the war effort. And then when the war is over, everyone hoped that, well, you know, Imperial Germany had been, de had been defeated, the old Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, the, the Tsar had been overthrown in, in Russia. The world was now going to be made safe for democracy, as the phrase was. But what ended up being the world? The world ended up being soon emerging what? Communism in Russia. A few years later, fascism in Mussolini's Italy. Ten years later, in 1933, Hitler and the Nazi movement came to power. And even in the Western democracies, France, Britain, the United States, particularly during the Great Depression years of the 30s, a growing extent of government regulation, government control, government spending, government debt, 
intrusions of government in people's lives. In the United States, an example of that is shortly after becoming president in 1933, using a wartime emergency piece of legislation left over from the First World War, Franklin Roosevelt nationalized everyone's gold. You could no longer privately own gold. So if you had gold coins, the gold bars, bullion, you had to turn it over to the government for paper money. Or if you refused, you were subject to arrest, imprisonment, and just confiscation with no compensation. So this was happening in the countries that supposedly were, were, were remaining voices for freedom. And then, of course, the war made it worse. The destruction, the greater controls in the wartime years of the Second World War. So, and it seemed that the new ideal was socialism. Yes, gov if we could plan in wartime, surely we should continue and plan in peace for a better world. In that environment, the, li the, the remaining advocates of free market, limited government liberalism felt as if their ideal was now going to be lost. And so Hyatt brought together, in this, just two years after the end of the war, Europeans and Americans to this location in Switzerland to try to ask themselves the following question. What does liberalism mean? How can liberal ideals be restated in a way that can become persuasive? And how might we then do this to try to move the tide back in a liberal direction and away from collectivism and socialism? And that became the founding of the Montpelerin Society. And it, in, it acted as a catalyst and an inspiration for admittedly still small, but a growing number of intellectuals, academics, people in the business community, people in the world of journalism, to come together and grow and influence. And in fact, one of those, the, 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 the impacts of the Mont Pelerin Society was bringing about the founding of the Francisco Marroquin University. Manuel Ayao was a member of the Mont Pelerin Society. Who knew, he knew all these famous original members, Hayek, obviously, Ludwig von Mises, the famous German free market economist, Wilhelm Repke, all of these people, Henry Hazlitt. He, Manuel Ayao had the opportunity to know all these people, learn from them, and to be part of their circle. And it's because of an institution, not only, of course, but like the Mont Pelerin Society, that became an inspiration and a basis of thinking about and laying the foundation for the institution that you are now here having the opportunity to study at. Um, I, I just wanted to give you an, uh, an idea of, of that context that perhaps you did, weren't aware of. So that's actually a, a good entree and a beginning to what I did want to spend a little bit of time talking about. And that was another famous economist uh, of the period between the two world wars. And that was an Austrian-born economist named Joseph Schumpeter. Now, if any of you are taking economics classes or business-related classes, I would hope that at least the name Schumpeter has come up, because he really is known as, as one of the, 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 the great economists, uh, particularly, as I will explain, on the theory of entrepreneurship and, and dynamic positive change in the world. Uh, a brief thumbnail, I have it up there on the slide. He was born in the old Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, he, in a part of Austria-Hungary that today is part of the Czech Republic, uh, he attended the University of Vienna with some of the famous Austrian economists of the period before, obviously. So he studied with some of the famous Austrian economists at the University of Vienna before the First World War. Uh, he taught at a number of Austrian universities after he graduated himself. Then in the immediate uh, period after the First World War, with the new small Republic of Austria, he served as a minister of finance uh, during part of the great Austrian inflation, just as there was a great German inflation going on at that time. Uh, he was the head of a bank uh, for a few years that during the inflation went bankrupt. Uh, the creditors of the bank were not happy and the story is he had to sneak out of town at night to avoid the creditors. But he ended up uh, moving and teaching at the University of Bonn in Germany, uh, which he did from around 1925 to 1932. Uh, just before Hitler came to power in 1933, 
He was offered a position at Harvard University in Boston, Massachusetts, and that was a position he then accepted and held until his death in 1950, when he was only in his mid-60s. Uh, I've listed there some of his famous books. One of the most famous ones, uh, and an early one, he was a young man in his early 30s, uh, The Theory of Economic Development. That's where he first develops his idea of the entrepreneur as the dynamic innovator of change. I mentioned a number of others, but the crucial ones are uh, a two-volume work that he wrote in 1939 on business cycles, which he hoped would be the, the opposing vision to the emerging Keynesian revolution, which unfortunately it did not do. And then the book that I want to talk about uh, with you, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, which he published in the middle of the Second World War in 1942, uh, 80 years ago this year. And then a book that came out after he died, a book that he had been working on for many years, it's over a thousand pages, The History of Economic Analysis which uh, he had written most of, but the, the, the last couple of chapters were left as only incomplete notes and rough draft, and his wife uh, sort of prepared those last chapters, and then it was published in 1954. It's considered a classic in, in the history of economic ideas. Even if you read it, and if you know a lot about the history of the early development of economics, you may not agree with all of his interpretations. You're just impressed but the immensity of his knowledge, the amount of reading that he did in several languages and could just draw upon them and explain them with great clarity and precision in, in this thousand page book. Because he basically talks about economics from the ancient world to his time. For Schumpeter, it is the entrepreneur who is the center of the capitalist system and all of the dynamic improvements that have been experienced over the last 200 years. And this is actually from that 1911 book. Uh, I sort of quickly uh, extrapolate some quotes here. What is the nature of the dynamism and innovation of the entrepreneur? He is the introducer of a new product, is one which the consumers are not yet familiar with, or of a new quality product. The introduction of new methods of production, technologies, machinery, uh, 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 cost efficiencies that make it possible to produce not only more goods but less expensive goods. Uh, the opening of new markets that had not been reached by uh, private enterprise earlier. Uh, the conquest, as he puts it, uh, and the discovery of a new source of supply of re uh, raw materials or of half manufactured goods that enables uh, products to be made of, of a better durability or an improved quality. And then also, the, just the organizational structure of businesses, the carrying out of a new organization of any industry, which may result either in the creation first of a monopoly or to be innovatively competitive to, to, to weaken existing monopolies. So this is what the entrepreneur does. Change comes from, from this creative man of vision who has an idea, an imagining, who thinks of a new way of doing something, a product never marketed before, a way to make something less expensively or with new technologies, and then undertakes the uncertainty and the risk of using his own savings or savings he's borrowed from others and un overseeing this new or an unimproved or innovative production process to bring the product to market. Better, new, less expensive, hoping that the consumers will desire it and be willing to pay a price that will cover his expenses and earn him a profit. He is the innovator and the risk taker of the market economy. If he is successful, he earns the profit. But he's always aware of the fact that his very success in earning him profit will soon attract competitors, rivals who say, look, how can I make what he's done differently better than him, less expensively than him? Okay, and I will try to capture some of the profits that he has discovered to be there and compete them away. So his very successes generate the rivals to undermine his innovative position. And that's the dynamism constantly going on in the market. He restated this in this book, Capitalism, Socialism, Democracy, in a way that has become famous. He referred to it as the perennial gale of creative destruction, the perennial gale of creative destruction. I'll just quote this quickly if you want to follow there. 
In dealing with capitalism, we are dealing with an evolutionary process that incessantly revolutionizes the economic structure from within, incessantly destroying the old, incessantly creating a new one. This process of creative destruction is the essential fact about capitalism. The fundamental impulse that sets and keeps the capitalist engine in motion comes from the new consumer's goods, the new methods of production or transportation, the new markets, the new forms of industrial organization that capitalist enterprise creates. In capitalist reality, as distinguished from its textbook picture, this kind of competition which counts is the competition from the new commodity, the new technology, the new source of supply, the new type of organization, the competition that commands a decisive cost or quality advantage. It is hardly necessary to point out that competition of this kind we now have in mind acts not only when in being, but also when it is merely an ever-present thought. It disciplines before it attacks. The businessman feels himself to be in a competitive situation even if he is alone in his field. What is Schumpeter saying here? Again, if some of you have taken some basic economics classes, how many of you have taken some basic economics? Okay, some of you. Well, if you read it, there's usually this, Im this imagery of two contrasting market situations. A perfect competition model with many, many competitors. And then the opposite of it, the monopoly situation, one seller. And, the, and, th and that becomes sort of the benchmark of saying, well, is the market competitive? Is the market monopolist and therefore maybe inefficient? Schumpeter says no. You cannot judge the market by looking at a moment in time. It's like taking a frozen frame out of a motion picture and judging what's going on from the one frozen frame out of the motion picture. How do you know what it means unless you have looked at, well, what went on before in the motion picture, before that frozen frame, and what follows? The analogy I make is imagine that you have this frozen frame out of a picture, motion picture, and you see a man hanging in midair off the edge of a cliff. Is this a good situation or a bad situation? Well, oh my gosh, he's hanging in midair, gravity. But why is he in this situation that you're seeing there, like a frozen picture? Well, what went before? I usually tell my students we can imagine two possibilities. Oh, he was cornered by a gang of murderers, and they threw him over the edge to kill him on the rocks below. Or could we not imagine a different story? He was being chased by the murderers, and he knows that now at the edge of the cliff they're going to kill him. But he looks down, and far below is a river. And he's not sure how deep the river is, but maybe if he chances it and takes the jump, he may be able to survive the fall into the river, and the, and the current will take him away, and he will save his life. So is it a good thing or a bad thing he's hanging over the edge of the cliff? It depends upon what went before, right? It's either, oh, he's being killed, or it's a way to survive by escaping. And you don't know that until you see the, unless you see the whole movie. You can't judge it by, oh, the little picture in the economics textbook, the perfect competition situation, the monopoly situation. It doesn't tell you anything by itself. So Schumpeter was saying you could only judge the market by taking the long historical view, what's going on over years, even decades. He considered that the liberal ideas of economic freedom, which began to become more widely practiced in the early decades uh, and middle decades of the 19th century, brought about all the transformation that we take for granted in our society today. And again, I'm going to use two quotes here. Before 1914, under capitalism, the world was rapidly internationalizing itself, as I was explaining. Free movement of commodities, restricted, if at all, only by customs tariffs, freedom unquestioned in principle of migration of people and of capital, all of this facilitated by unrestricted gold currencies and protected by a growing body of international law that on principle disapproved of force or compulsion of any kind. At home, practically all civilized countries professed allegiance to the democratic ideal. The freedom of the individual to say, think, and do what he pleased was also within very wide limits generally accepted. This freedom included the freedom of economic action, private property and inheritance. A free initiative and conduct were essential elements of that capitalist civilization. 
And then in 1946, he wrote an article about capitalism for the new edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. And in this article, he said, the familiar features of capitalism and its political complement, liberalism, were laissez-faire, in particular free trade and sound money, meaning unrestricted gold currency, a pacific, though far from pacifist, attitude toward foreign nations, international peace, not conflict, unprecedented respect for personal freedom, not only in economic, but in all matters, the principle of leaving individuals to themselves and of trusting their free interaction to produce socially undesirable, excuse me, socially desirable results. However, he goes on in Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy to say that in spite of all of these, these, these advancements and betterments, there are two forces at work, in his opinion, working to undermine the capitalist system. First of all, as I was explaining, for Schumpeter, what is the, 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 the guiding individual of the market? This creative, innovative, self-leading, taking in charge entrepreneur, the individual. He was afraid that with the growth of the corporate structure in, in business, that the, 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 the free and, and self-guiding entrepreneur would get lost in the bureaucracy of the corporation. And that more than that, the bureaucracy of the, of the corporate world easily could start working hand in hand with what? The, the business bureau, the government bureaucracies. And that would lead to not freedom of enterprise, but the stranglehold of growing government intervention, regulation, and control through, quote, government business partnerships, the corrupted form of capitalism. The, the other element that he was concerned about, and is the one that I believe has, has remained an enduring problem, and that is his fear of the intellectuals as a group in society. He, he like others, have called them the second-hand dealers in ideas, the second-hand dealers in ideas. Uh, most people are busy in their own lives. You work, you have a job, you run a business, you have a family, you have friends, you just have things that fill your time. You can't know about science or the arts or literature or politics or or just a general world of ideas. So how do most of us get our ideas? They're given to us by a group of people in the division of labor who we call the intellectuals. They write for the newspapers, the magazines, uh, the, the, now today on social media, obviously. And, and, and they, they sort of know these things, and then they are the, the conduits, the, 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 the middlemen who then summarize, synthesize, interpret the meaning of these things which we learn. And that's what the meaning, well, do you know about a, a, this or that? Well, to be honest, I only know what I read in the newspapers. Well, who writes the newspapers? You see, that's the imagery there. But he thinks the problem is, is that as a group, the intellectuals tend to, to, to have a, a, an inherent dislike for the capitalist system. Now, why this is the case is a very interesting question itself which he partly analyzes. But in, in a nutshell, let me say this about it. And some others also advance a similar notion. Intellectuals view themselves as underappreciated. Oh, here's that businessman. What, what, what has he invented? Oh, a clicker. What is this clicker compared to the great novel? the beautiful work of art, the grand philosophical idea, reflections on the meaning of justice. He's made a million dollars. I barely have enough to live on, but I deal with the important things. What can be so unjust than this fellow who, he just made this, and he has millions. I talk about the good, the beautiful, the better, the just. I live on this low professor's salary. Or I have to make my living working for an advertising company, coming up with these short little advertising phrases when, when nobody's interested in my great novel. They won't even publish it. You understand what I'm saying here? They resent it. What does he do, a thing? 
So, that, so, so the market unfairly rewards what is not important and, and unfairly does not reward that which are the important things. So there, there's this resentment. This resentment then leads to another element in this. Look at all the injustice in the world, not just to me, but the man in his grand home with his chauffeur Mercedes Benz. Look at that poor man with four children and he can hardly have, feed his family. What kind of justice that he has so much and that man has so little. Oh, surely there'd be a better way to organize for more economic equality. And that leads to the third element of this, right? His, his, the injustice towards him, the unfairness of society, and then finally, but I and people like me, we deal with the big things, the important things, the big picture things. We know, rising above the petty affairs of everyday life, we know how to remake society. We know on the just distribution of wealth. We know the, how business should be organized. We know how, how the world could be made fairer. We should be in charge. We should be the political paternalists. We should be the social engineers. That's the, their mentality. Now, this is a quote from, from the book, Sean Peter's book. The man who has gone through college or university easily enters the intellectual class in a thoroughly discontented frame of mind. Discontent breeds resentment, and it often rationalizes itself into the social criticism, which is the intellectual spectator's typical attitude towards men, classes, and institutions. The role of the intellectual group consists primarily in stimulating, energizing, verbalizing, organizing this material of anti-capitalist sentiments and resentments. The intellectual group cannot help nibbling, right, the little bites, nibbling at the foundations of capitalist society because it lives on criticism and its whole position depends on criticism that stings. And this hostility increases instead of diminishing with every achievement of capitalist evolution. Notice what he's saying there. You'd figure that the more capitalism improves the society, raises the standards of living, makes life better, the criticisms should get less. No, the more successful capitalism, the more hysterical the critics become. I'm gonna make one quick comparison to show how much capitalism has changed the world. If we could go back into in a time machine 200 years, let's say to 1820, if we looked around, what would be the world population in 1820? One billion people. That's the best guess by population, the demographers, economic historians. There were approximately one billion people in the world 200 years ago. They also estimate that out of that one billion people, 90% lived in poverty, which meant only 10%, by remember the lower standards of that time, lived comfortably by that standard. What's today, 200 years later? The world's population is now estimated to be approximately 7.7 .7 billion, seven, over seven times, almost eight times bigger. But what do the demographers, the economic historians say? And the UN collects this, right? The UN agencies collect this information and release it. So this is the UN speaking. They say that out of that 7.7 .7 billion people, today less than 10% live in poverty. So almost eight times bigger population, and now only 9% live in poverty. So far more people populating this planet, and all of them virtually out of poverty. We could imagine that if capitalism was left free at least to a great extent, to do its job. You, now, you or your children would see something that's only been a dream since the beginning of, of recorded history. And what is that dream? The end to poverty. At the end of this century, that idea of where is your next meal coming from? Are you gonna have a roof over your head and that of your family? That could be gone. Doesn't mean everybody will be wealthy. Some will be less comfortable, more comfortable, but that's different than poverty. Okay, there's a big difference is, oh, I only have one television and he has four between, oh my gosh, I can't feed my child, right? There's a difference in that. But you, in your lifetime or your child's lifetime, your children, I know it's shocking to think about that you'll have kids, but someday it happens 
biology can tell you how those things happen. I read it in a book somewhere. Uh, but the result of that is that by, in your lifetime and your children's lifetime, the end of the 21st century, in that, low, that material sense, poverty could be gone if capitalism is at least sufficiently can allowed to continue to do this dynamic work and cre creative improvement of life the way Schumpeter tried to explain. Why do the intellectuals have this impact? You would figure, Schumpeter says, that in spite of what they say, the ordinary person could look around and say, look, look at my lifetime and just in my life, why, why, this is only 15 years old. The smartphone, right, the iPhone, Steve Jobs, the iPhone. I know it's hard to believe today when all of us use this thing, but this is, only, this is less than 15 years old. Yeah, there were the, 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 the little phones, but you know, like little flip phones, and all they did was do telephone calls, and maybe you could do some you know, basic arithmetic, adding, subtracting. But he, in this Schumpeter sense, was the creative entrepreneur. He had this idea, and he told his engineers, I want you to make it so it could fit in a hand. And I want you to do it in such a way that one finger, the thumb, can push the keys. And I want you to load it with the, uh, the most creative technology that exists or you can come up with so that it's a phone, it's text messaging, it's email, it's music, it's movie streaming. It is, it is, it is. I mean, can we, we can't even imagine living without it anymore. This is the life. I have here, you know, the, the, they have that, that app called I, I Library or iBooks, right? In this little device, I have downloaded probably three or four hundred books. I have a walking library just in my phone besides everything else it does. And, and, and I, I also have video calling, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I can't escape from my wife. She can find me everywhere. <laughs> See, in the old days, the wife says to the husband, You're, why didn't you call that you were going to be late? Oh, I'm sorry, dear, but I could not find a public pay phone on the street. I couldn't communicate it. I couldn't call you. I can't escape now. <laughs> And she tracks me everywhere. I mean, she's like the government. She knows every move I make. <laughs> so you'd figure that people living and experiencing these types of dramatic improvements in life would say, ah, you know, what, what are these critics saying? But Schumpeter said, that's the problem. You can only appreciate capitalism if you take the long run view. To see all it's been doing over years and decades. But in the short run, People are too wrapped up in their lives, only see what's immediately in front of them, and can't appreciate it, the nature of the capitalist system. And again, this is a quote here. The case for capitalism can never be made simple. People at large would have to be possessed of an insight and a power of analysis which is altogether beyond them. Why? Practically every nonsense which has ever been said about capitalism has been championed by some professed economist. But even if this is disregarded, rational recognition of the economic performance of capitalism and of the hopes it holds out for the future would require an almost impossible moral feat by the have-not. That performance stands only out if we take that long view. Any pro-capitalist argument must rest on long-run consideration. In order to identify himself with the capitalist system, the unemployed of today would have to completely forget his personal fate and the politician of today, his own personal ambitions. For the masses, it is the short run view that counts. Like Louis XV, at the end of, before the French Revolution, like Louis XV, they feel après nous déluge, after us the flood. Secular improvement that is taken for granted and coupled with personal in, in, or individual insecurity that is acutely resented is of course the best recipe for breeding social unrest. So it basically says is that the ordinary person finds it difficult to, to understand why government interventions, regulations, controls are going to harm them in the long run. 
I'll just give one standard example that economists always talk about, again, if you've taken an economics class, the minimum wage laws of the government. Oh, look at that person. He's, he's unskilled. He doesn't have much experience. Look at the wage that the market is willing to pay him. How can he live on that? How can he support him? We have to pass a law to make it mandatory that no businessman can hire a worker for less than the minimum wage. He can't, he can't be put on the job for less than this, a living wage, a fair wage. Isn't that good and just for everyone? But what is not seen? The same thing that works on us every day as consumers. We all know commonsensically that if we buy something in the marketplace and we now go back in the marketplace and we've seen that the product we've been normally buying goes up in price, we have to decide, gee, this, this has become more expensive. Uh, is it worth it? Maybe I'll buy less. Or I can't afford it as much as I did before. Maybe I'll, I can't buy it at all right now. I'm going to buy something else. We all know that we respond to prices like that. Why wouldn't we expect the businessman to do the same? He has no revenues to pay salaries other than what he earns from selling us, the consumers, a product in the market. He has to ask himself, what do I think I could earn if I have successfully guessed what consumers want and the price they would pay, and therefore the cost that I can incur in hiring people and purchasing machines and, and acquiring resources, raw materials, to make the product. Okay. If the costs are too great relative to the expected price and revenue, it's loss making. He's not going to do it. He'll only do it if he has the belief, the confidence, that there's a chance for a profit. Well, if the wages are raised for low-skilled, unskilled, unexperienced workers, the businessman has to say, is this minimum wage going to be worth me hiring? Maybe he's going to cost me more than he's giving as value added to the production enterprise. The result is the minimum wage runs the risk of pricing out of the market some who the advocates of the minimum wage say they want to help. An unintended consequence. But it nonetheless helps, hurts some of the very people the law is meant to help. But that's not seen. That's not seen. The average person doesn't understand this. And therefore, oh yes, it's good, it's desirable, either introduce a minimum wage or raise a minimum wage, but you'll in fact end up hurting some of the very people you say you want to help. Furthermore, if someone loses the job or never has the chance for that low paying job, and because he's unskilled, inexperienced, how does he get the workplace experience? If he's not hired in the first place, how do you learn enough? Maybe you didn't finish high school, you don't have much of an education. How do you get the on the job training to become more informed, more skilled, uh, learning how to work with others in a workplace environment that over time could raise your value to an employer. So either the existing or some other employer will be willing to pay you more in the future. But if the minimum wage locks you out of the labor market right from the start, you're kept in poverty from the start. Now, you don't have to be an expert or a major in mathematics to know that no matter how low the market may, may, wage may seem, it's bigger than zero if you're unemployed. Zero is a very small number. And that, that zero is not the wage you want to earn because the minimum wage has made you unemployable. That's the type of thing that Schumper is saying that people find it difficult to follow. Now, what, how, how successful or truthful has, has Schumpeter's prediction become? Because I don't know if you looked at the, the opening title uh, uh, slide that I had, but I had a quote from him right there. And uh, matter of fact, let me quickly go back to that. Can capitalism survive? No, I do not think it can. He believes that capitalism will be replaced by some form of socialism, dictatorial socialism, the supposed democratic socialism, but some form of pretty much comprehensive government planning. That was his, his fear, prediction fear. Capitalism stands its trial before judges who have the sentence of death in their pockets. They're going to pass it. Whatever the defense may hear, the only thing a successful defense can possibly produce is a change in the indictment. That is what capitalism is accused of. So you can change what, what, what capitalism is condemned for doing, but they're still going to declare you guilty as charged, you die. 
So how correct was Schumpeter? Well, let me suggest that he was wrong in one sense. Yes. In the decades since the Second World War, government has regulated the market more. Government has raised and burdened industry and people in general with taxes. They've taken more responsibility to redistribute wealth, the welfare state. But in spite of all those things, which as a liberal, I think, harm the economy, it still remains the fact that certain core institutions of a liberal market society exist. Degrees of freedom of exchange, degrees of private property, degrees of ability for a, an entrepreneur to enter the market and try and create and improve. Steve Jobs. In fact, Schumpeter said in the book that if, if, the, if capitalism was left free enough for the next 80 years, that is, till us, it would create the same wondrous innovations for the next 80 years that has been created for the previous 80 years. But he was fearful capitalism would ha wouldn't have that chance. Well, even with the regulations and the redistributions, enough of a market order has remained that it has given us an immense improvement in our lives over these last eight decades. But what about the intellectuals? That is the problem that continues to haunt capitalism. In spite of all these more improvements of 80 years of rising standards of living and, and eliminating immensely poverty around the world, what has changed is the indictment, not the guilty charge. The, the opponents of capitalism still want it heavily regulated or even abolished, whether they mean in a formal abolition of nationalizing, like an, under the old Soviet socialism, or the government just totally controlling it, like under fascism, where it on paper remains in private hands, but the government tells the private businessmen what to do, what to produce, what price to sell for, what wages to pay, etc. In the old socialism, what was the argument? Oh, capitalism oppresses the workers. Capitalism exploits the workers. Class conflict. Well, what has the world seen, particularly in, in, in Western countries, and including here too, a growing middle class, right? Rising, the, 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 a rising middle class and fewer poor. So where's the class conflict if people are improving? So that is not a successful argument anymore. They've changed the charge. And now they say capitalism perverts the social justice of the system. Political correctness. This is the totalitarian ideology of permitted words and actions. Oh, capitalism unfairly allows actions, people freedoms in acting in certain ways, saying certain words. We have to control words. Politically correct language, politically correct rhetoric, politically re correct forms of association and interaction and associating with people. Political correctness is the new, one of the new avenues to condemn capitalism as too much bad freedom. Identity politics. I don't know how much this has arisen here in, in, uh, in Guatemala, but in the United States and growingly in Europe, oh, all this talk about rights of the individual, the vision of the individual, no, society is group-based. You are your race. You're white, you're black, you're Hispanic, you're Asian, you're male, you're female, and all the 942 genders in between. As, as I like to put it, you know, what do the anthropologists say? What, human-like creatures have been on the earth, what, 200,000 years, 300,000 years, what, a long time. So let's say 200,000 years. For 200,000 years, we got to buy with this absurd idea that there's boys and girls. And thank goodness in the last 10 years, we've discovered we don't know what we are. What? This is the idea of identity politics. You are these things and you are what you think you are. Okay? You are what you think you are. But that is what they identifies you as they're pigeonholing you, classifying you. And now that is to determine your fate as individual. It's not your work, your effort, your dreams, your willingness to bear risk, make sacrifices, try to be determined to do better. No, it's not individual effort that might be rewarded in the marketplace. Your place and your status, 
socially, economically, materially, will be determined by the political system in the pulls and the power plays between these different groups, whites, blacks, Hispanics, Asians, males, females, transgender, multigender, trans species. I feel like a dog today. I guess I am. Now, if someone thinks they're a cockroach, are you allowed to step on them? I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, but this will determine your life opportunities. Because now you'll be classified in these ways. Either they classify you or you self-classify yourself as part of this tribal group. And then politics will determine your social status and opportunity. Cancel culture, the suppression of all opposing views and ideas by erasing all them from history and contemporary society. Again, I don't know how this is affecting you, but in the United States, and again, in, in Europe, pull down the statues of the sexists of the past, the racists of the past, people who may have not been racist or sexist, but had ideas that could be identified by us today as implying racism or sexism. You know, in the old Soviet Union under Stalin, Stalin would carry out purges of what he viewed as enemies of the Soviet state. He'd have you killed, he would send you to a slave labor camp in Siberia. But maybe there were pictures of you, even with Stalin. They would now do a new edition of a, of a book, and that picture of you and Stalin, they would airbrush you out. You're not in the picture anymore, they take you out of the picture. It's like you never existed. A, a, a non-person. That's what cancel culture is about. We're going to pull down the statues, we're going to remove him then from the history book, we're going to denounce him if he's a contemporary today. We think he holds ideas or views or you said something 20 years ago that we think is, sounds racist and he's going to lose his position in society. We're going to fire him. He'll lose his salary. He becomes exiled in the society. Not to a labor camp like Stalin, but it destroys your life. That is totalitarian making the past fit the ideology of these advocates of this new form of political correctness on identity politics today. If you've ever read George Orwell's novel, 1984, which was published in 1948, he imagines a future society in which there's a ministry of truth. And this ministry of truth rewrites the past to fit the party politics of today. The anti-hero in the novel is a fellow named Winston, and he works there. So whatever the, the, the totalitarian government has as its new party line, he goes back through the records of the old editions of the newspaper and rewrites them so the past fits the truth of the party today. That's what cancel culture is about. Finally, two others, and we'll, we'll talk. Sure. The Green New Deal. This is the idea, oh, global warming climate change. The world is going to end in 12 years, right? I hear, I suppose you heard this. The world is going to end in 12 years. Do you know they were saying the world was going to end in 12 years 20 years ago? It's a moving 12 years. It's a never-ending 12 years. But you see, the, but what is the presumption? How shall the world respond to a changing climate, whether created by human factors or not? Imagine that you, man, human actions had nothing to do with it. It's just the world, you know, the, the, the globe changes. There's been ice ages in the past. There's been warming changes in the past, long before industrialization. The, the world just does this in these rotations. So let's suppose that's going on. And there is a human element. How do you respond to this? Their presumption is there's only one way. National and then global government central planning. We will determine the technologies everyone's to use. We'll determine what's going to be produced and how it will be produced. We'll decide what consumer goods with what product and raw material ingredients will be manufactured and sold to the public. We'll decide on people's standards of living. And in the process of commanding the global economy, we will institute social justice and fairness because we'll be commanding everybody's station and position in, the, in life. That is the new intellectual vision. And finally, what I call pandemic authoritarianism. The precedent that has been set by the last two years, oh, science says this virus is threatening the world. And what are, following the science, what do governments around the world say? Stop producing, 
Don't go to work. Stay home. Only shop when we tell you to for the products that we declare to be essential. Don't go too close to a person. Wear a mask or be penalized, threatened, put in, a, in jail. And people passively say, well, if the government says, because science says, and we have just like robot zombies, yes, I'll stop working. Yes, I'll stop earning a living. Yes, I won't leave my house or my apartment. Yes, I'll wear a mask. I won't go near other people. Yes, and I'll start doing those things again when government says it's okay. Okay, like in the back of your car, some people have those little things on their back of their car with a little animal with the head that moves around. Yes, tell me when I can come out of my house. Yes, having set that precedent. Should we be surprised that if some other health situation arises or some other related emergency, what will government say? Well, it worked last time. We saved millions of lives, supposedly. So people have to accept us doing it again and again and again. That too is part of the central planning agenda of those who believe that they know how you should live better than yourself. That's the remaining challenge that we face. That's why you're important. What do I mean by you as an individual at an institution like this one? No matter what your major is, what you want as a career, you're lucky enough to be at an institution that attempts to introduce you, bring you to have a bit of knowledge about the ideals of a liberal society, the dignity and freedom of the individual, the right of thinking for yourself, speaking and writing what you believe is true or you find persuasive, freely associating both in the marketplace, competitive supply and demand, and outside of the marketplace, normal human associations of, 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 of neighborhood, friends, philanthropy and charity, church. That's the free society. Why is it important? How did it come about? after centuries, thousands of years of government control, to be liberated only in the last 200 years by these liberal ideals and principles. You've had an opportunity, a chance, with all your other things you're learning, to be introduced to these things. You're the next generation. When I say that if, if things continue the way they have been, by the end of this century, something like world poverty could literally be gone. And people standards of living all over the place would have continued to continue to rise. But it will only happen if people understand it, value it, and in their various ways in their corners of life, speak out, willing to articulate, defend, work for. And that's your importance, to prove that Schumpeter is wrong and these intellectuals cannot win. That is Ayn Rand, who I'm sure some of you have heard of, said, a new generation of new intellectuals who believe in the, in the dignity and freedom of the individual and the importance of capitalism to make all of us better. Thank you very much.